And we are moving into the disclaimer that we are funded by SAMHSA, um, but we, of course, are the views presented today are reflected of Dr. Schoenfeld and of our center only and of our, ourselves only. So um, we're grateful for the funding and also grateful for the support. And this is the um, famous, hopefully at this point, um, tiny font slide, which is our invitation to map out, we are entering our third year as MHTTCs, Mental Health Technology Transfer Centers, um, regions across the country to provide no cost technical assistance to you, both for the mental health workforce and the school mental health workforce. We are Region 9, so if you look at the bottom left-hand side um, that says 9, we support the U.S. Pacific Islands, which we have representation from today. Thank you, thank you. Hawaii, we have you in the house. Uh, Nevada, Arizona, and California. And I think I saw, um, and Paul just put in his name from Arizona, so we have officially representation from all of our region. Welcome, welcome. And for many of you, you're calling in from across the country and other regions. We welcome you as well, uh, and we also encourage you to check out your regional MHTTC to support your learning moving forward. We at Region 9 have two foci of school mental health. The first is school uh, mental health leadership and literacy, so bridging the worlds of behavioral health and mental health and education so we can speak the same language, so that we can do collaborative work to support the needs of, the, of, the, of those that we serve. And the second track is school crisis readiness, recovery, and renewal, um, with whom we, for which we partner with Dr. David Schoenfeld at the National Center for School Crisis and Bereavement. Um, and it's under that second track that we are supporting today's learning. All right, moving ahead. Um, I kind of already went over this. This is who we are. We provide no cost TA. Um, join us, join us. So today, today is a third part of three series. They're not necessarily um, building blocked, so you can watch one, two, and now three, but they are connected because they're connected by David's expertise and research and voice and, and perspectives as, um, as he has decades of national um, expertise supporting schools and all of us who work with schools through, um, during, before, after crises. So you can watch parts one and parts two that are recorded if you download the, the PowerPoint. And, um, and I just want to pause here before we invite David on, which is that um, this conversation about supporting all of us as we think about what it means to restart or to open the school year looking, looking into August 2020 and beyond is that many of us are navigating grief in our own lives, grief in, those, uh, in the lives of whom we serve, our students, our colleagues, our schools, um, or a uh, sense of vicarious or shared national collective grief. And so we at the Pacific Southwest MHTTC, and I know this is a shared value of Dr. Schoenfeld's, we really believe in the concentric circles of grief. We believe in helping us as a country strengthen our skill set, our language, and our comfort levels talking about grief as a school mental health issue, talking about grief as an educational issue, and talking about grief as a life issue, <laughs> a workforce development issue. So um, why this, why now? Um, I just want to hold, again, acknowledgement that many of us from across the country, some of us might know the context of um, how we're working in schools looking forward, and some of us might be still sitting in deep uncertainty. Some of us might be navigating our own grief, and some of us might be here on the call with our professional, um, with our professional lens. And so all of that is okay, and all of that is invited. On that note, I am um, incredibly grateful to welcome Dr. David Schoenfeld to come on webcam and to, uh, and to begin his teaching. David, if you can just do a couple lines about who you are and uh, the National Center for School Crisis and Bereavement, and then continue forward. We're really grateful to have you, David, um, and we look forward to learning. Sure. Well, thank you. Um, so in terms of my background, my training is in developmental behavioral pediatrics, and as mentioned, I direct the National Center for School Crisis and Bereavement, which is located at Children's Hospital Los Angeles. Um, and so I'll probably be talking a little bit more about some of the experiences that I've had with different schools and school districts, but let me just go uh, right into the presentation. 
So what, I planning on, what I'm planning on covering today is really I'm going to start by talking about psychological first aid just as one model of universal support in the aftermath of a crisis. Then I'll turn to some of the common reactions to a crisis and what we might expect to see among students when schools do physically reopen or reopen virtually. And some of this will be to guide some of our preparedness efforts so we can get ready for that first day back. And then I'll, I'll spend much of the time talking about just some practical suggestions for helping students cope with the pandemic um, and, and gearing this more towards school professionals. And then I do want to touch on the topic of professional self-care, recognizing the need to mitigate the impact that the pandemic has on school professionals themselves. So um, as I mentioned, in the immediate aftermath of a major crisis event, Psychological first aid should be provided broadly to all those who are impacted. Um, and that involves offering what we call psychoeducation to help people understand the impact of crisis and more importantly, uh, what to do to cope. And also involves providing supportive services to promote effective and normative coping strategies and adjustment and to accelerate the natural healing process. All the adults working with students, um, I think there was one slide missing, all adults working with students um, should understand the likely reactions and how to help them cope because anyone that interacts with students and their families can be a potential source of assistance and support, but actually if they're unprepared, particularly if they appear to be disinterested or unconcerned, they can actually become a source of further distress for students and staff. I often tell the story of some work that I was doing with the Flight 93 staff um, at the Flight 93 Memorial. Um, so if you uh, remember on September 11th, Flight 93 was en route to Washington, D.C., and the passengers and the crew became aware of the terrorist attack on the World Trade Center and also were, became aware that they had terrorists on board their own flight. And the crew and staff decided that they were going to sacrifice their own lives and crash the plane intentionally in a rural area before it arrived in Washington, D.C. in order to save the lives of others. Um, and so the plane came down outside of Pittsburgh. And so um, the National Park Service has a park there uh, with a visitor center for the memory of the Flight 93 passengers and staff for their heroism and self-sacrifice. So I had gone out and done some training for them. And after one of the trainings, I was talking about psychological first aid. And someone came up and he said that actually the groundskeepers were trained there, that if there's somebody who um, arrives on this, you know, on the grounds, and if you're cutting the grass, they were told to stop cutting the grass, establish eye contact, and ask if they can be of any assistance. And the person who told me this said, we're not here for the lawn. We're here for the visitor experience. This is sacred ground. Now, if you can train the National Park Service groundskeepers um, to be, to have that type of a perspective, and I would say anyone who works on a school campus should also have that perspective. They are there for the student experience. And we also find out that a lot of times support staff are actually the ones that connect with students and observe things in different ways and also have personal connections that may allow them to find out things and to communicate things to students. So, um, you know, I remember doing some training on how to support grieving students to bus drivers. And um, one of the bus drivers looked at me at the beginning of the training and said, you know, what do you expect us to do? We, we drive the bus. How could we support grieving students? Fortunately, one of the other bus drivers gave the example and she said, the other day I was dropping kids off at the middle school and I asked one of the students to stay back when everyone else had exited the bus. And I looked at him when we were alone and I said, you know, I heard that your brother died. No kid should have to deal with that alone. Will you at least promise me you'll go in and speak to a counselor as soon as you get into, into the school building today? And he looked at her and said, yes, I'll do that. Thank you. And then she turned to the other bus driver and she said, we can make a difference if we just make the effort. So we want to make sure that everyone is trained in psychological first aid or some equivalent model. So let me just uh, go over a little bit about what you'll see in psychological first aid. And this is as described by the American Red Cross. For mental health professionals already familiar with uh, PFA or psychological first aid, I hope you'll find this framework helpful for sharing the information with the broader school staff. And for those of you who not, are not familiar, this will be a very brief introduction. So the first step is to just have observation or awareness. And I'm going to address some of the common symptoms of adjustment difficulties very soon. You then want to make a connection, help people feel comfortable and at ease, 
and be kind, calm, and compassionate. People often pick up on how we present ourselves even more than what we actually say when they're in a moment of crisis. I had the opportunity to uh, go with a colleague of mine during her first visit to an oncologist after she had been diagnosed. And during that visit, which lasted over an hour, she was there with her husband. And I thought the oncologist did a very nice job of discussing both what he thought was going on and what the treatment was going to be. And as we walked out, she just looked at me and she just said, I don't have cancer. And I just looked at her and I said, you just signed consent for surgery to remove your tumor and to start chemotherapy right afterwards. Why would you think you don't have cancer? And she just looked at me and she said, he seems so hopeful. I said, yes, he's hopeful that he's going to successfully cure your cancer, which he did, but you still have cancer. Don't you realize that? And she just kept saying, but he seems so hopeful. So people pick up on what I refer to as our affective tone when they're in distress, often even more than what we say. So we have to be conscious of how we present ourselves. You also need to assist with basic needs. So right now in the pandemic, that would be making sure that they have food and a safe place to live, for example. I was in um, New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina during one of my visits. I think this one was about three or four months afterwards. And someone told me that they had been in church uh, over the weekend. And in the middle of the sermon, someone's cell phone went off in the audience. And the audience made a lot of noise about how inappropriate that was. And finally, the minister just stopped the sermon, turned to the congregation and said, that call, it might be your contractor, you better answer it. And basically what he communicated was even talking about the word of God was not as important at that moment as making sure that you had a safe place for yourself and your loved ones to live. And the person who was telling me this just looked at me and said, my minister, he really gets us. That's what we want. We want all the kids in the school and the staff to make sure that they feel we get what they need too. So we want to make sure that we attend to basic needs. You then want to listen to people who are in distress and being able to actively listen is sometimes even more important than knowing what to say. You want to give realistic reassurance, not false reassurance, but realistic reassurance, and then encourage good coping. And I'm going to come back to review some coping strategies in a little while. You then want to help people connect, help them identify supports in their family and the community, and also help them figure out how best to help others. And again, I will also address that more later. Then you want to give accurate and timely information. This is particularly the case when a crisis is unfolding, as it is during this pandemic. But you don't want to give unnecessary or graphic details. During this time, it's kind of good to remind ourselves that we should all watch our media consumption. Make sure it's a healthy diet and don't, don't consume too much. Adults should try to keep informed through focused but periodic attention to trusted media outlets or other trusted sources of information. Don't listen to, watch, or read continual coverage, even though I'm quite aware it is available. This pandemic is going to be here for quite some time, and people are just going to get overwhelmed and exhausted if they try and keep up with all the information. I'm sure many of you have already noticed that. What's often helpful is to remind people and ourselves that there are two main reasons to listen to, watch, or read media coverage during a crisis. One is to be reassured, and the other is to learn practical steps to keep yourself or those you care about safe. If you aren't getting more reassured or learning practical information about actions you need to take, then it's a good time to disconnect from media, whether that's television, radio, print, or social media, at least for a period of time. We should be advising students, to also limit their amount of media exposure. This is actually a good time for everyone to just unplug and connect instead with family and friends, whether that's in person or remotely. And that will allow parents um, the opportunity to focus their attention on children's needs and provide as well as receive support. So getting back to PFA, uh, the next step is to suggest a referral resource. So you need to be aware of school and community mental health resources so you can offer them to families and then end the conversation. That's actually probably the hardest step. I should have said from the beginning that psychological first aid is not considered a mental health treatment. It is really just an intervention. It's supposed to be population-based and delivered generally by individuals who do not have formal mental health training 
and it's often delivered uh, episodically. In other words, you don't know the person ahead of time, and you don't expect to continue a relationship with them, so it's a brief intervention, often on the order of 10 to 15 minutes. So we want to make sure that everyone in schools, school campuses, know how to do this. Now, before I go on to talk about, you know, the next step is identifying need, I do want to say that parents and other adults who support children, such as educators, tend to underestimate the extent of children's reactions to a crisis situation, especially when it relates to internalizing symptoms. We sometimes do a good job of observing behavior in students, but we can't really observe how they feel. We, ask, we have to ask them about it. And children may withhold complaints of their reactions because of concerns that they're abnormal or at least somehow inappropriate, or because they wish to protect their parents or other adults who are visibly upset. Adults, including educators, often avoid discussion of troubling events in order not to contribute in some way to student distress, afraid that they're just going to upset students and say or do the wrong thing and just make matters worse. But I hope you realize that saying nothing is precisely the wrong thing to say during a crisis. It communicates to children that adults are unaware, unconcerned, unable, or perhaps worst of all, unwilling to be of assistance. So it is helpful to anticipate some of the common reactions to a crisis that may be seen among students. And I'm going to tell you, you'll see the same type of symptoms in adults as well. Some of them are listed on this slide, although I will say from the very beginning, the common reaction, the most common reaction is not on this slide, and that's nothing. Um, as I already mentioned, often you will not see anything, but you, so please don't wait for symptoms before you reach out to children and adults to provide support but let me go over some of the symptoms you might see. One is fears related to the pandemic as well as anxiety. And so the fears may be specific and related to the crisis, but they may also be just more broad based. And that's where you get the anxiety. People become fearful. So for example, you may see children and adults now more afraid of the dark. And that doesn't specifically relate to the pandemic, but it does relate to being in a stressful environment. We often also see school avoid avoidance after any crisis event. Students may be reluctant to separate from parents or other family members for fear that something may happen if their parents are not there to protect them, or something might happen if uh, they are somehow not there to protect their parents. Now, after sheltering at home for an extended period of time, when students are given the opportunity to return to school in person, we should expect many of these students will be afraid to return to public spaces such as schools, particularly when the virus is still circulating, which it is likely going to be. Many parents in turn will also be reluctant to send their children. So it's gonna be important that we reach out to students who don't show up when schools do reopen, but it's also important that we stay connected to students now and until schools reopen and seek support for those for whom you already have concerns such as those who didn't attend or engage in virtual classes when schools were closed or didn't submit assignments as consistently as they had prior to the pandemic. Getting back to the symptoms, you can also see sleep problems. That can be trouble falling asleep or staying asleep, difficulty waking in the morning, or nightmares or other disruptions in sleep. And when individuals don't sleep well, they don't do very much well the next day or sometimes for several days. So we often really want to make sure that we pay attention to sleep disruptions by trying to have good sleep hygiene and good sleep conditions. I'm not suggesting that we medicate individuals for sleep. Um, actually, in over 30 years of doing this work, I've not once written a prescription for um, medication for sleep in the setting of crisis or loss. Um, but I do spend a lot of time talking about sleep hygiene. And if people have questions on that, I'd be happy to discuss it. You may also see changes in appetite or eating, difficulty with concentration, and that often leads to disruption in academic performance, and if it's an adult, in work performance. As you can imagine, you can see sadness and depression. You can also see anger or irritability. So you'll find that individuals who are stressed tend to be less tolerant of change, less tolerant of unpredictability, and less able to handle additional stress. Unfortunately, I think we're going to have a lot of all three as this pandemic continues. You can also see for individuals who are highly stressed that they may uh, show some distrust and suspiciousness. 
And those reactions can challenge pre-existing relationships among friends and colleagues and family members. And it makes it hard to form new relationships with when people are acting that way. So when kids come back to school and staff come back to school, if they don't have a lot of trust and they're suspicious and they're keeping physical distance and they're wearing masks, you can imagine that's going to be hard to form some of the bonds that we rely on to make school participation so meaningful for children. You can also see the new onset or the increase in alcohol and other substance use. So you should be sure that, you're, that you're, you have substance abuse evaluation and treatment services as part of your recovery and re-entry plans. And I would actively discourage the use of alcohol for relaxation or socializing in school-sponsored activities for adults during the recovery process. Um, you know, I was talking with um, one uh, school mental health professional in the New Orleans area after one of my visits on, during one of my visits to uh, New Orleans after Katrina. And this was again several months afterwards during this particular visit. And she kind of told me that that comment I had made about alcohol use really resonated with her. She said that one day um, about a month after uh, the hurricane, she had gotten a call on her cell phone from her daughter and her daughter was asking where she was because school had ended probably about an hour before. And she said, I told her that I'm, you know, with some friends at school and we're at happy hour at a bar. And she said, and then my daughter said to me, mom, you've been at happy hour every day since Katrina and you don't seem happy at all to me. She said she realized at that point that she was drinking more than she should and she had just not recognized it. So I've already had schools tell me that they've, you know, shipped wine to their school staff while they've been sheltering in place. I've seen places have virtual happy hours. I think we really shouldn't be encouraging the use of alcohol during this time. Um, it's, not a good, it's not a good way to cope with distress because it can cause more problems in and of itself. Um, in addition to the uh, symptoms I've mentioned, you can also see physical symptoms such as headache or stomach ache. And this could be due to psychological distress presenting as physical symptoms, but it can also be due to stress hormones causing physical problems. So stress hormones can increase hypertension, worsen diabetes control, uh, promote asthma attacks. So you can actually see that um, the symptoms that you have, the physical symptoms, may actually be due to psychological distress, uh, due to the stress hormones themselves causing physical problems. And unfortunately, all of the things I mentioned can also be from COVID, um, directly from the coronavirus infection. So you may see shortness of breath, you may see a uh, fever with headache. So you'll see a lot of these things overlap and can be very confusing. And so we really have to make sure that we have adequate support for our school nurses and others who are in the position to try and evaluate which, which is the cause. Now, I will say that in most situations, um, there's a combination of psychological distress and physical causes for physical symptoms. So it's usually not an either or. Sometimes it's just what the balance is between the two. Next um, issue, adjustment problem that I have here is grief, and I'm going to discuss that later. And then the last one on the slide is guilt. People somehow manage to find reasons to feel guilty irrespective of their experience in a crisis or their role. And at some level, often unconsciously, it may actually be easier to feel responsible for something you did, didn't do, or should have done to prevent someone you care about from getting infected, ill, or dying or having a serious outcome from the illness, rather than to accept it actually had nothing to do with you. Because if it had nothing to do with you and someone you care about had a bad outcome, that means it could happen to someone else you care about, and there may be nothing you can do to prevent that. Now that may make you feel better momentarily because it gives you the illusion of control, but it is just an illusion. And so although it may provide initial reassurance, it's not going to actually help prevent others from getting ill. And it leaves the person with guilt that impairs adjustment. So if you convince yourself that the reason that a family member died or was hospitalized was because you didn't clean the handle of a doorknob that you thought someone might have touched, you can go and just clean that doorknob over and over again, but that's probably not going to prevent someone else from getting sick. And then it's going to make you feel like you made a mistake to cause it. Now, you can also see survivor guilt uh, from individuals who survived 
or even uh, people who feel guilty that they didn't experience loss or trauma to the same extent that others have. Now, these reactions may all be due to the pandemic itself, but they may also be due to a wide range of other stressors associated with the pandemic. For example, the financial impact of unemployment or partial employment may cause concern among parents that children pick up on. Or the stressors associated with the pandemic, including the financial concerns, may increase arguments among the adults in the household, contribute to parental anxiety, depression, or other mental illness, or parental substance use, or even contribute to domestic violence. So during the pandemic, don't just ask, about, ask if students had a family member become ill or die, but instead, you need to ask students broadly about how they're doing, because they may actually have problems in other areas that are just as significant for them. So then the next question is, what can we expect to see when schools reopen, and how can we prepare best to address those needs? So first, I wanted to emphasize the importance of addressing services through the multi-tiered system of supports, where the predominant focus and activities are delivered through universal and tier one services. And I think the pandemic underscores the validity of that perspective, which is what we always recommend in schools. But to illustrate this, I'm gonna start with sharing some findings of mental health needs of students that persisted six months after the World Trade Center attacks, which is about the same time frame for when schools in many communities are likely to reopen in the fall. Since it's been about six months since the pandemic started, at least if you say from March, uh, till September, when many schools will likely be opening again, um, at least for virtual classes. So there was a needs assessment that was done um, six months after 9-11 uh, in New York City schools. And um, this was conducted by Applied Research and Consulting, Columbia University Mailman School of Public Health and the New York State Psychiatric Institute. They surveyed a representative sample of over 8,000 students in all five boroughs in grades 4 through 12 uh, attending New York City public schools. And the student compliance rate was actually quite high. It was nine, about 92% because they were able to use passive consent with the older grade levels. Among other variables, they surveyed students' self-reports of their current mental health problems as well as self-reported impairment in functioning. In other words, things like students saying that they weren't able to do their usual activities in the same way that parents or teachers were often upset with them, or they were just having unexplained problems with schoolwork. So students were felt to have a probable psychiatric disorder only if they reported the symptoms consistent with diagnostic criteria in DSM and also reported impairment in functioning. So in many ways, this is actually probably a conservative estimate of the actual problems the kids were having. And this slide outlines some of the key findings related to the prevalence of probable psychiatric disorders persisting six months after 9-11. One out of every four students, or 27%, met the criteria for one or more of the probable psychiatric disorders that were assessed in the study. Rates of PTSD, depression, agoraphobia, or the fear of public spaces, or open spaces, and separation anxiety were at least two or more times higher than rates in other U.S. communities that were surveyed prior to the events of September 11, 2001. Approximately one out of 10 had PTSD, major depressive disorder, separation anxiety disorder, and panic attacks. And 15% had agoraphobia or a fear of going out or taking public transportation. And this 15% was a threefold increase over a baseline rate of 5% in another community surveyed prior to 9-11. And that's one of the reasons that I'm highlighting some of these findings. In my opinion, it was likely this, particularly the agoraphobia, was not due just to the World Trade Center attack itself that one day, but also ongoing concerns of terrorism, and that included concerns about anthrax, which was another infectious disease that you couldn't see that could be life-threatening. Now, while no one knows exactly what impact this pandemic will have on children's mental health, although we do have some data from China, and are getting some initial reports here as well, where we're showing increases in depression and anxiety and other mental health problems, I do think we can predict that we're gonna see an increase in children's fears, at least, of leaving their home and re-entering public spaces such as schools. Now, beyond the high prevalence of probable psychiatric disorder, and the real reason that I'm talking about the need for universal support, 
was that what was also shown was that adjustment problems, again, persisting six months, were still were nearly universal. 87%, or almost 9 out of 10 students, reported at least one PTSD symptom still persisting six months later. 76% reported often thinking about the World Trade Center attack, and 45% reported trying to avoid thinking, hearing, or talking about it, the avoidance criteria. 25% found it harder to keep their mind on things, 24% still having problems sleeping, with 17% reporting nightmares. 18% stated they had stopped going to places or doing things that reminded them of the events. And 11% of the students reported at least six of these symptoms, which was what was felt needed to be consistent with probable PTSD. I do want to note that these same adjustment symptoms may, see, may be seen in other, men, other mental health conditions, as well as from bereavement. For example, sleep problems, nightmares, and difficulty concentrating can be seen in PTSD, but they can also be seen in bereavement, depression, and anxiety disorder. So although the authors refer to them as trauma symptoms, I think it's actually best to view them as adjustment problems. Now, at least two thirds of the students that had what was felt to be probable PTSD six months after 9-11 also reported that during those six months, they had not sought any mental health services from mental health providers within or outside of the school system. And these findings show us that after a major crisis event, uh, adjustment difficulties are gonna be pervasive and they're going to be long-term. And in most cases, they're not gonna receive traditional mental health treatment. Now this is despite the fact that at the time, free counseling was available at every school throughout the New York City Department of Education due to substantial federal recovery funding. Unfortunately, I don't anticipate that we're going to have that type of recovery funding in schools to increase mental health services. And I also think we're gonna have trouble just maintaining the mental health services and supports that were in place prior to the pandemic because of all the financial strains that are being placed on schools and their lowered budgets. And I think all of this together underscores the need to shift from exclusively a medical model, which would be characterized by screening, evaluation, diagnosis, referral, and then treatment for individuals that you perceive to have a mental illness and instead focus predominantly on building resilience um, rather than delivering treatment and providing universal supports. Now, this would have to be coupled with incorporating school mental health professionals to provide additional support and services to students who require more assistance, the tier two services, as well as those students who might need even intensive services that characterize tier three. Although, to be honest, much of the tier three, three services are probably gonna to need to be delivered through referral to community mental health services because the schools are gonna be pretty busy just taking care of tier one and tier two. So what I'm gonna do is just stop at this point and uh, ask Leora to help us with this sharing portion. She's asked in the chat box to please tell us one takeaway that's resonating with you right now. Yeah, thank you, David. So we want, you know, we, when we want to provide learning, we want to provide learning in a way that also allows us to have a pause moment <laughs> um, and, and have some reflection. And so we want to offer you one moment to name one takeaway. It might be the relationship between um, resilience and interventions. It might be the lift that David named at the very top around affect and tone. Um, so in the comments box, if you can please put your, thank you, Joanne, if you can please put your takeaways. And if you also have specific questions, you can put them in the questions box. But we're really kind of hoping one moment to think about what are your takeaways um, at this point in the conversation. So we're going to wait to see some. Let's see. All right, Tiffany. Having staff trained in some of the psychological first aid dynamics as they may have more contact with students and really appreciated the example, David. You know, you've, all, you've got the good stories, so thank you for that. Um, Deborah, finding after 9-11 and how they might, ah, the findings, I see, the applicability, the takeaways of learning from what we have been through in the past and how that might inform what we go through now and how we plan for the future. The parallels of this pandemic and 9-11, so there's some resonance here. Um, 
yep, we're seeing <laughs> we're seeing that's a big takeaway. That's a big trend that's coming up. Um, yeah, and the iteration that all staff have a role, no matter if they're in the classroom, if they're in the proverbial bus driver seat, if they are in maintenance, they every single person has a role. Yeah, yeah, the naming of grief and loss. Mm -hmm. And the focus of resilience at the universal level, so as the basin, as the basin for the work that we move forward. And exactly, focusing on the far-reaching tier one supports, tier one being foundational, non-negotiable, the soil, the fertile soil from which the work grows. Thank you. And then Carla, and we're going to move after a couple, Carla also is mentioning to not wait, David, your invitation to not wait for symptoms, <laughs> right? Don't wait for the symptoms, but um, do the work even assuming that what is, might cause the symptoms already exists. And Jennifer is naming the storytelling um, and that to also hold the role of intergenerational historical trauma um, and also to share how stories have healed, intergenerational healing. Um, throughout throughout generations. Thank you. Um, and Linda is also uh, heard that Linda's takeaway is the need to start with the adults at the school. And we agree with you. That's we believe in the concentric circles. And I know that David will um, move forward um, and uh, and continue the teaching. Again, encourage you to put questions in the questions box where it's where you know we really appreciate when you answer each other's questions. And I will be um, watching those to. Um, to answer and to bring up in the Q&A section if we get to that. David, I'm going. All right. So let, let me move now on to some basic advice, really to how to talk to and support students during the pandemic. And for many of you, this will be very basic. And again, it may help serve a context for sharing this with other school staff. So the first thing, as was already mentioned, was don't pretend that everything's OK when clearly it isn't. Children can pick up when parents and other adults, including educators, are not being genuine and honest. And they're, not, they're going to be less likely to ask questions or seek advice if they sense that's the case. Children also benefit from knowing that parents and other important adults in their lives, such as their classroom educator, have similar or at least their own concerns. And more importantly, they need to learn from those adults how to deal effectively with troubling or distressing feelings. We can't expect students to share their concerns when we're unwilling to share that we even have some ourselves. And we certainly can't help them learn how to cope effectively with distress if we never model coping uh, strategies and techniques that work. But this doesn't mean that adults should share all of their concerns. Some concerns are really primarily those of adults, such as related to how the pandemic may impact employment or income of parents and other members of the extended family. And parents really should try to discuss these concerns privately. And I should say, I'm using the term parents whenever I mean adults that are helping to care for children. Those could be guardians, grandparents, aunts, uncles, really any of the adults that provide that type of support. Now, if children do pick up on concerns about finances, such as through things they've overheard or public or social media, if possible, parents should share reassuring information that's honest that helps place the financial concerns in a context that's relevant to the child. For example, you might say, with all that's going on, it's no longer really a good time for us to buy a new car. But don't worry, we have enough money saved that we'll be able to meet our daily living expenses. In some families, though, to be honest, financial concerns were a significant issue prior to the current pandemic, and they're only exacerbated now. But whenever you can, in discussions with children, Parents should try to focus on what they honestly can provide, rather on what they fear they may not be able to pay for if the situation worsens. For example, it isn't helpful to comment to primary grade children that the drop in the stock market just wiped out their college fund. Even if parents are worried that's what's happening, you have time to figure that out later, it's not really something to be sharing with your kid. What you want to do is first find out what the individual child's fears, concerns, or skepticism may be. Children, as we know, often have very different fears or concerns than adults. And you can't reassure people, whether that's a child or an adult, if you don't know what they're actually afraid of or concerned about. Otherwise, you're probably not really offering reassurance, but rather you're telling children why you aren't worried. And when two people each talk from their own perspective, we call that arguing. And arguing isn't a very effective way to provide reassurance. 
We also shouldn't tell students that they shouldn't be worried or try and minimize their concerns. Instead, help them learn to deal with their uncertainty and fear and share with them strategies to deal with distressing feelings rather than pretend that they don't or shouldn't exist. You should be sure to include positive or reassuring information when possible and present overall, at least, a hopeful perspective. To be honest, this is not a particularly good time to convey to students a strong criticism of the government's response to date or your personal candid assessment of the leadership of those in public office, unless they're asking you how they should vote in November. Try instead to convey that overall, at least, you hope and expect that scientists and public health officials are learning how best to handle the situation and that you anticipate that your community, your state, uh, the country will be making decisions to address the pandemic. Then explore with students different strategies of dealing with distress, discomfort, anxiety, and sadness. And some of these are listed on, on this slide. That might include reading or hobbies to promote healthy distraction, or talking to others, journaling or blogging, or art and music to promote expression of feelings. You actually need to do both. Sometimes you need to uh, face and discuss and process your feelings, and other times it's healthy to step away. But the problem comes is that while you want distraction, the other person in your home might be wanting to talk about it or vice versa. And you can see how that will cause conflict. It's just important that we recognize you do need to do both. And it's just you may not be wanting to do it at exactly the same time. Some other strategies listed here include exercise and yoga, appropriate use of respectful humor, and relaxation techniques and mindfulness, which can be taught even to very young children. For those of you with additional training in these areas, you can also offer children self-hypnosis and guided imagery, to, um, and that can be learned to deal with anxiety, and cognitive behavioral therapy can, and approaches can help children replace some negative thoughts with more positive interpretations that will change individuals' feelings as well as their behaviors. Now, these latter strategies um, do require some prior training for the mental health provider. Um, and, and some specialized skills. But all of these techniques uh, can be taught to children, even very young children. Now, ideally, at least for the latter techniques, you'd want to start that when it's not in the middle of a pandemic because it requires um, a certain amount of concentration and practice and coaching. And learning new skills is easier to do when you're not under stress. But actually, all of these can still be taught to children even when they're upset during a pandemic and the basic principles can be learned and basic skills uh, can be learned as well. Now, what you also want to do is help children identify developmentally appropriate steps that they can personally take to protect their own health and to help others. To be honest, we're going to expect children to take care of themselves to a certain degree. The teachers are not going to be able to make sure that everyone stays six feet apart every moment or that they're washing their hands properly when they need to do so or keeping their mask on we need to teach kids to adopt self-care so that they understand the importance of these strategy and they know how to do it. For younger children, let them pick out the soap they prefer to use to wash their hands and let them provide input into whatever they would like as their hand washing routine, such as picking what song they'd like to sing. Now, I'm not trying to be critical here and I don't actually know who recommended it, but to be quite honest, if your birthday happened during this pandemic and you couldn't celebrate it with friends and family and have a party, probably the last song you want to sing every single time you wash your hands is Happy Birthday. So let kids pick out what song they want to sing. We should also identify ways older children can safely help others, whether that's for such things as dropping off food outside the door of elderly neighbors or making regular phone calls to speak with grandparents who are just feeling isolated. If children can contribute to the response in ways that they think are meaningful, they're gonna be less likely to feel helpless. And finding ways to help others can help all of us, including children, feel some sense of agency during a time when many of us are just feeling powerless. Now I talked about universal supports, but some kids are gonna need more. And the pandemic and discussion about the impact on families may remind children and adults of other difficulties in their lives. Um, that might be events in the past, ongoing challenges, or concerns about future losses or crises. It may be that they are also become more acutely aware of the impact of uh, racial injustice on them and those of their family and friends. 
All of these children may find this uh, time to be particularly difficult if they're trying to deal with other stresses in their lives as well. Children who are anxious or depressed before the pandemic obviously will likely need even more support. So we should be encouraging families to reach out to their mental health and pediatric health care providers, at least by phone and email, to get some additional advice and support. We also have to prepare adults that when children are highly distressed, they may regress socially act less mature, become more demanding or selfish, and have more difficulty getting along with peers and family. Some students may also just appear disinterested and say they don't care about the pandemic, it isn't bothering them, because they are overwhelmed with their own concerns. They may need to focus first on their own needs. What does this mean for their college plans, for their vacation, their sports or hobbies, their friendship network, etc.? And they may need to focus on that before they're able to start to think of the needs of others, this is often a sign, paradoxically, not that they're not interested, but they're under stress and having difficulty coping. We need to make sure that adults don't make them feel guilty for thinking about and sharing that distress about how the crisis impacts them personally, even if the impact is far less than it is on others. Adults um, may get frustrated by having a child, for example, complain for a long period of time about they couldn't have a graduation party or they weren't able to celebrate their birthday and it's unfair and it's just unreasonable. You can imagine a parent just getting frustrated and finally saying, well, you know, there's some kids who had family members die. You know, it seems pretty selfish to just be thinking about your birthday party. That isn't gonna make them feel better about not being able to experience their birthday in the way they would have. And it's just gonna make them feel guilty and unlikely to come to you with additional concerns. So you might ask, well, why would adults do that? And they do it because they're stressed too. And they may have the same social regression. While crisis response can bring out the best in people, in my experience, it tends to bring out their stress. And we likely won't, all of us, won't be at our best at least all the time. And being around people who are needy, demanding, self-centered, or distressed isn't particularly fun or satisfying. And it is likely to be your experience going forward if you haven't already experienced it. So we need to be patient with students, with their families, with staff, and above all, we need to be patient with ourselves. And I'm gonna to return to professional self-care briefly later. We also should appreciate what impact all of, the, all of this is having on us as adults. Educators and other school staff likely will have concerns about their own health or those of family members and friends. And I encourage you, do what you can to address these needs. Don't just focus on the needs of your students. Now, school staff are most likely to feel overwhelmed when they feel unable or unprepared to provide meaningful assistance. But there's actually a lot we can do, even in the midst of an evolving pandemic. While we can acknowledge the limitations in our current knowledge and our current resources, we shouldn't minimize the value of our guidance and the assistance we can and do provide. Just because we don't know everything doesn't mean we know nothing of value. You all know strategies that have helped in the past to decrease students' distress, and I encourage you to try some of those to begin with. You may not feel that what you can offer, especially remotely, is enough for all students. Students may want, and they may even need more than you can provide at times. So reach out to colleagues and resources in the school, in the school district, and community when you feel more is critically needed by an individual student. But all of us should still try to recognize and celebrate the positive contributions you can and do make. The moments you were able to help a child smile, if it's only for a moment, or help them learn something so that they felt a sense of accomplishment during a time they would otherwise just feel overwhelmed. Now, when I work with healthcare providers in the aftermath of devastating disasters, they generally all report to me that they feel helpless and wonder if they're making any positive impact at all. And I suggest that they periodically huddle as a team, not just to identify new problems or ongoing problems, but also to share and celebrate their small successes. We also have to try to set reasonable expectations and communicate these to students, parents, educators, and other school staff. Simply put, students are not gonna learn as much schoolwork during this time period as they would have had we been able to keep schools in session and we weren't in a crisis. So don't try and keep the same pace of learning, or this is just going to overwhelm the students and the educators. And then the time they spend together is going to be more of a source of distress than it is a source of comfort and assistance. And I'm going to warn you all now that when schools do resume, you're not going to be able to catch up and teach everything that was missed. Even if the pandemic were to miraculously end and schools open tomorrow, 
there's no way we can make up for several months of missed learning or incomplete learning just by accelerating the pace we teach. At best, we can just get to our baseline rate of teaching, and there will be material we learn that we didn't able, that children weren't able to learn during this time period. But there are other things that they learned, and we need to recognize that at some level, the curriculum has just changed. If we're teaching students how to cope with distress and adjust to a crisis such as this pandemic, then we're helping them learn life skills that are going to make them more resilient in the future and more capable of dealing with future adversity and loss. And in the end, to be honest, these are the lessons that are going to be most important. But they're also difficult lessons that are generally not learned easily or quickly. So before I go in to talk more about this journey of crisis and the time frame, what I want to do is just um, stop for another reflection point. And I'll turn this over to Fiora. <laughs> Hi, David. Thank you. Okay. So uh, we just talked about, I mean, we, um, David, expand. I'm actually, I'm just going to invite you. You know the drill. Why don't you put a takeaway? And, you know, instead, sometimes I think of takeaways as in, like, the one thing that I would really like my colleagues to learn, to hear, to have, <laughs> or the one thing that I want to remind myself um, when I think about waking up tomorrow and engaging in my practice moving forward. So I'm going to wait and see um, who comes in and what comes up. Thank you for taking the time for reflection. It's an it's a idea of self-care. Um, all right, Tracy, expectations need to be adjusted. Christine, to be patient with myself and encourage others to be patient with themselves. That is... If that is the one takeaway, I'm going to take that for myself. <laughs> Francesca, that we should not set unrealistic expectations that our students can learn as much as they normally would or that we might hope that they normally would. <laughs> um, Laura, that we're all doing our pandemic best. Mm, I like that phrase a lot. And Pat, no matter how fast we teach, schools can never really catch up and to stay in the moment of support. Yep. Um, and Peggy, we may not know everything, but we might know something. Nice. You all are coming up with really phenomenal taglines that I might um, borrow from <laughs> moving forward. And Richie, emphasizing on life skills rather than just teaching coping skills, or maybe the both and, right? Life and coping, because we need them both. And to hold space and not to assign guilt for being in, for our colleagues responding to other, responding to their needs. That's right. Don, appropriate honesty, and Nicole, not pretending that everything is okay. We know it. Our students can read through us. They know when it's not. They also know when it is, and they know that we are, uh, we are also living in this human life. If there's anything that's distance learning, both student mental health and also education has brought us is potentially a more personal bridge from our living rooms to our students. Yeah, that's right, Gail, being vulnerable to human. Thank you. All right, I'm going to continue to add resources and respond to your questions in the chat box and in the comment box, and I'm going to... Um... Okay, well, thank you. So what I wanted to do now, because um, I, I only have a few slides left, we sh um, and so please start adding your questions at this point into the question box. Um, I'm going to go over some of the uh, journey of crisis. As I said, this doesn't go quickly, and these are hard lessons to learn, but um, I just want to talk about what you can see. So first off, if we think about the fact that we have a baseline, this is a slide that really shows coping over time. So there's a baseline, and it, it's not a straight line. There are times when things are going well, and there are times when we experience distress. I do want to say not all distress represents crisis. Um, actually, crisis events are not defined by the event themselves. It's actually defined by the individual or system's capacity to cope with the stress with the absence of external support. So what's just really upsetting to someone may be a crisis to someone else. So you may see people who are in distress, but don't, but don't presume that they're in crisis. But also, if somebody is experiencing distress, please recognize that we still should give them support. Resiliency doesn't mean that you don't experience distress, it just means you can cope with it. We still should help people when they're feeling distress. But let's talk about now what happens if it's actually a situation where you exceed their capacity to cope, and it is a crisis event. 
So you'll see that's at point B that event occurs, and by point C they're feeling vulnerable, and then by point D their usual coping, me coping mechanism had failed. At that point, if people are aware of the crisis, please realize if it's a personal or family crisis, others may not even know it's occurred and you may get no support. But in public crisis events, um, usually there's a coming together of communities, harder to do when you're physical distancing, but there still is some coming together where there's some shared sense of community that may not have been there before. I know in my own community, you can walk through the neighborhood, people stay on different sidewalks, they will cross the street to give you space. But what I have found, um, and have walked the same neighborhood over and over again, I have found that almost everybody stops what they're doing and waves and says hello in a way they really didn't do before. There is a sense that we're coming together, although there are things splitting us apart as well. But there is that sense where people come together, they provide resources, they often bring food, money, those type of things. Um, and people start to do better. But just as they start to do better, there's some improved functioning. But the point I'd like to make is that's actually one of the most vulnerable periods. Um, this it happens much more in adults than it is in children and usually after natural disasters. But you will see that sometimes there's self-harm or suicide that occurs. It's not the day of the event or the day after. It's usually weeks to months later. It's when some people appear to be back to their baseline, even though they probably aren't, but they appear that way. And others who are most distressed may conclude they're never going to get to that point. And that's where they feel helpless and hopeless. So that's actually our most vulnerable period, is when we start the recovery and we're into the recovery process, not in the middle of the crisis event. But most kids will not have suicide as a result of this. And we can, if you want, in the questions and answers, discuss suicide is the second leading cause of death among youth, 10 to 24 years of age. So suicide's not gonna get better in this situation. We still need to be prepared to assess it. But I am not predicting that we'll have very large increases in suicide, but we will have increases in distress. What often happens is that supports and resources get pulled back too soon when kids start to be doing better. And if we uh, do that, then some individuals will not return to their baseline. They'll just have a new baseline of continued impairment. We have to continue to provide support until individuals, children and adults, at least get back to their baseline functioning. And for some people, they will actually exceed their baseline functioning. And we've referred to that as post-traumatic growth. Individuals are changed by these events. This is a life-changing event. Um, everyone's going to remember it, um, and they're going to remember part of how they felt about it. And they'll also remember some things that they learned as a result. So individuals will be permanently changed. They're life-changing experiences. They're not necessarily permanently damaged. They're just different. They may actually emerge with a new sense of empathy, with new resiliency skills, um, with a new sense of spirituality, um, or more able to help others and help themselves. So individuals are changed as a result permanently, but they aren't necessarily damaged. You know, I was talking about this concept of post-traumatic growth to a group of foster parents after a large natural disaster in their community. And one of the fathers just raised his hand and said, that must be me. I didn't even realize this existed, but I think that's what happened to me. He talked about the fact that he had been, um, prior to this event, that he had been, he was young, he was happily married, he was working, I think, on Wall Street and finance, he had a young child, he was married, and he thought his life was perfect. And then his child developed an illness and died suddenly. And at that point, he started to question what he was doing with his life. And that included questioning his career. I'm not suggesting that um, a career in finance is not of high value, but his conclusion that he reached was that he was making money and making money for other people. And he wasn't really contributing to making society a better place. And he looked at me and he said, Finance, that's a job. I want a career. So he said, even though he was doing very well financially and very successful um, on Wall Street, he quit his job and went back to college to become a kindergarten teacher. Because he said, shaping the life of a young child, that's a career. And he could commit himself to that. So he became a kindergarten teacher, became a foster parent, and he was adopting a young child. And he just looks at me and he goes, is that post-traumatic growth? And I'm like, yeah, I think that is post-traumatic growth. But as someone had already um, mentioned during the, the, in the chat, in the comments section, that when you experience a crisis or loss, it often uncovers prior crisis or loss that you've had. 
I remember going to um, talk to a group of teachers um, about a school shooting that had happened in an elementary school. And I went over this concept and one of the teachers became very upset by that and started crying, not in the session, but when she got home and I was told most of the evening. And I saw her the next morning because she wanted to speak to me when I returned to school. And uh, she just said, I wanted to talk with you because when you said that, it finally dawned on me what was happening. She said that she wasn't in school the day the shooting happened. And actually there was one student that died and she had never met him. And she said, despite not being there and not knowing the child, she really was rattled by what, what happened. She was having trouble sleeping. She couldn't concentrate. She said she was very upset and she couldn't figure out why this was going on for a month or a month and a half after the shooting. And then when I made the comment, she figured it out. The day the child died was the day her brother had been murdered, I think 10 or even 20 years before. She didn't consciously make the connection. And she just said, that was what happened. And she said, and I just wanted to let you know that you helped me figure that out. And she said, normally I have an anniversary reaction each year. I know that and it lasts the day. I got stuck in this one for weeks and I didn't figure it out. And now that I do, now that I know that, I'll be okay because I can go for another year now. Um, and I'm sure I'll have the anniversary reaction again. She said, so I just wanted to thank you for helping me figure that out. So the issue is that many people go into fields like early education, mental health, social work, pediatrics, a lot of the helping professions because something happened to them during their childhood and they want to pay people back or pay it forward or something didn't happen to them. They didn't get the support and assistance they needed and they want to make sure no child has to go through that again. A lot of the people that enter helping professions have had hurt in their past. The problem is you're more likely to have that uncovered when you go to help the children. So ironically, the reason many people go into these fields is precisely what's going to make them most vulnerable to being hurt by being in those fields. So let me talk just briefly about some of the professional self-care issues uh, before we end. And I'm trying to advance the slide. It's telling me it doesn't want me to. So if someone uh, there, Leora, if you can help uh, figure out how someone could just, well, thank you. Okay, and I'll just tell you when the slides advance if I can't do it again. So exposure to trauma and suffering of others can lead to what's been called in the field a compassion fatigue. I just want to point out that empathy involves understanding and taking the perspective of another person, and compassion requires this empathy, but it goes further. And it includes the additional step of wanting to help and or desiring to relieve the suffering of another. And the word compassion has two Latin roots, which mean to bear or suffer together. And this element of sharing someone else's suffering is usually coupled with warnings about compassion fatigue, which tend to imply that compassion is somehow necessarily tiring, as if you're born with a fixed amount of compassion and you're just going to run out if you care too much or about too many people. But compassionate approaches can also be gratifying and bring meaning to the work we do. And this is most likely to occur when staff have realistic objectives of the purpose of their interactions. For example, if you're trying to support someone who's grieving or coping with a disaster, the goal is not to make them happy or take away their distress, but rather to help them begin to learn how to cope with it. You also, though, need to feel you have the skills and the resources to provide some meaningful assistance, that you're allowed and empowered to provide that support, and you're aware of and have the sufficient support to deal with the personal impact of this work. Compassion does require more emotional effort. But just as physical exercise can be tiring near term, but ultimately energizing and increase capacity for subsequent exercise, the capacity to provide compassionate care can grow with practice. Compassionate approaches also can be gratifying. They bring meaning to the work that you do, and thereby they can help decrease burnout. Staff should also be aware that hearing the trauma stories of individuals who have been impacted by crisis events such as the pandemic, when we are compassionate, can transmit some of that trauma to the helper, and that causes what we refer to as vicarious traumatization. Educators and school staff should be told that their role is to be supportive and to help students connect with professionals that can help them process their trauma and loss. It isn't necessary for educators and school staff to listen to their full trauma narrative in order to do that. In fact, that's often not helpful to the victims as well. 
Because if they share their whole trauma narrative with someone and then that person doesn't do anything except tell them to repeat it to someone else, that doesn't actually help them in the long run. So all of this underscores the need for professional self-care. But there are many challenges to self-care. One is allocating time when you have so much to do and everyone seems to need your help. And I tell people, I've often lost time, but I've actually never found time anywhere. You have to allocate rather than try and wait to find the time. Another barrier is feeling shame or guilt for attending to your own needs ahead of those of others. We have to recognize it isn't about putting your needs ahead of those of others, but instead recognize um, that you're attending to your needs so that you have the capacity to continue to help others. Another barrier is assuming others are having less trouble adjusting than you are. And as I already noted, kids often don't appear in distress when they are, and neither do adults. And I will tell you that professional mental health providers um, are actually even more likely not to share their distress with others. Um, this is actually not a superpower. Um, it is a problem. And we need to be able to share with others not necessarily all of our personal problems and secrets, but that we are having distress when we are in distress. A lack of modeling of professional self-care by those around you um, is also a barrier. So practicing self-care and sharing them with others, what you are doing to care for yourself may help others be more likely to help themselves. And then I just wanted to share some particular challenges for those in leadership positions among them. No matter what you do or how well you do it, you just have to recognize you're not going to be able to make everything okay during this pandemic. So don't judge yourself as being effective by just deciding whether or not people seem happy or unhappy, because they're going to be unhappy. Those impacted by a crisis often react to feeling out of control by trying to exert more control whenever they can. And I had predicted from early on in the pandemic that this was going to be an issue once we moved past the evolving or acute crisis response phase and start to talk about reopening schools and start the recovery process. People are then gonna have very different views about what should be done and they'll feel very strongly about that. Um, I see this almost all the time after school crisis events of any nature that it often revolves around such issues as safety. So when is it gonna be safe for students and staff to return to school and what steps are school leadership taking to eliminate the risk of this uh, pandemic? And that's not gonna be a reasonable goal you're not gonna be able to eliminate the risk of an infectious agent that's still circulating in the community. All you can do is try and balance risk and benefit. But what I will tell you is people aren't gonna agree on what the right benefit, um, risk benefit ratio is, and they're gonna feel very strongly about it. And they're gonna voice their views very strongly and passionately. That often causes a lot more distress. There will also be, often are, uh, differences of opinion on the timeline for returning to a primary academic focus. Commemoration memorialization can be contentious. I did another webinar on that. We're not at that point yet, but I do predict that will be an issue for some. And then how do you use donated funds or grants, or in this case, limited or restricted budgets? So this is one reason why you're going to find some parents of students who are going to be more difficult to interact with during the pandemic and subsequent recovery period. Those in leadership positions also should recognize that the reactions I mentioned among children and said could happen in adults also happen among professional staff, including mental health professionals and administrators, and that can challenge the team's working relationships. And then the last harsh reality is you can't stop and focus just on recovery. Pre-existing mental health needs didn't go away as a result of this. Learning and responsibilities didn't go away. Budgetary concerns didn't go away. You have all of this added on top of what was already, for most people, a very difficult position. Now, I've said a lot of things that's just very overwhelming, and I do want to say I've had the opportunity to collaborate with numerous schools and districts throughout the country and abroad, even after some very devastating natural disasters one, for example, was um, the earthquake in Sichuan province in China that killed over 69,000 people in one day, including many children. And I've worked with a lot of schools and communities after mass shootings. And in many of these situations, I've seen similar types of stress and magnitude of the crisis and the challenges are enormous. But I have become impressed by the resiliency of schools, school systems, and communities. And I'm confident that schools and communities are going to rise to the, the occasion. But as I already noted, being resilient doesn't mean you don't experience distress. 
It just means you can cope with it. So you'll, what I want to say is that this is going to be difficult, but I also know that schools will meet the enormous needs of their students and their staff as they've done every day before the pandemic and will keep doing even after the pandemic. And the National Center for School Crisis and Bereavement is committed to partnering with schools throughout the recovery period. Further information about the center and free resources can be found at schoolcrisiscenter.org, our website. The banner at the top of the landing page will take you to the COVID-19 Pandemic Response Resources page. There you'll find a guidance document on supporting grieving students during the pandemic, which will guide you to free video and print resources on the Coalition to Support Grieving Students webpage, which is grievingstudents.org. And this I discussed during my last webinar. The COVID-19 Pandemic Response Resource page also has presentations for educators and parents on talking to and supporting children during the pandemic, as well as supporting grieving children and links to other uh, school professional organizations, web pages on this topic. I'll also say within the past week or so, we just added some sample scripts that go over talking points for educators for the first day of school. We have four different versions, whether it's for elementary or middle and high school, and whether it's for remote classes or in-person classes and goes over some of what we suggest covering on the first day back to school during the first period in each of those situations, um, as, as well as some model language that can also be used. And you can download those and customize them to your own school district. And um, another resource, as I mentioned, was the website of the Coalition to Support Grieving Students at grievingstudents.org. And before I conclude, um, I was just asked to uh, go over um, and I already mentioned that this is where you can get um, the material for the first day back at school. And I, I'm just going to end by highlighting some takeaways. Um, and many of these you've already shown me, you've taken away. So one is that universal support should be the primary response. And again, that's focus on building resilience rather than a medical model, just focusing on identifying mental illness and providing treatment. Although you do obviously need to do that as well. This should be coupled with incorporating school mental health professionals to provide that additional support to students requiring more assistance. And another take home is that all school staff should know how to be supportive. And there are practical strategies all educators can use to offer that support and assistance to students. And lastly, that professional self-care is critical to mitigate the risk of compassion fatigue and vicarious traumatization. And I'm just gonna end on this slide which lists contact information for the Center of the National Center for School Crisis and Bereavement. And at this point, I'm going to turn it back uh, to Leora. So she's going to open it up to your questions. Thank you. So, you know, I want to, we're going to, this is a time to post questions in the questions box. We've got a couple minutes for questions. Um, and, and I'm going to encourage you to name questions that are maybe less specific, but potentially more applicable to um, the over 140 of us that are on the line, um, and that really deal with both supporting everyone in the school ecosystem, grief and crisis, um, and speaking to David's expertise. So in the questions box, please feel free. Um, and in the meantime, while people are posting their questions, I want to address what Eric had just named in the comments box. Um, and Erica, I'm grateful that you just named the intersectional, multidimensional, and, um, and multimodal aspects of grief and loss and pandemic that are deeply, deeply structural, that are deeply, deeply um, intersectional, and that um, we cannot um, see and experience and support our students by myopically treating one pandemic um, in a colorblind way, meaning that we know that this color, that we know that this pandemic um, is disproportional across um, the construct of race and across ethnic and across class lines. And we also know that many of our communities have already been navigating historical and structural grief and crisis and loss. And so there are layers of that complex and ongoing and chronic trauma. So I want to name that, Erica, and appreciate you for lifting that up. I'm going to put a um, link in the chat box. Uh, while we're still pulling up questions, and that's to join us this Friday for our second session on supporting schools and students' mental health in the context of racial violence. And um, we really hope that you join us for that conversation. Okay. Can I also add, I, I, I know it can feel very overwhelming that it is so complex and layered and there's so much going on. And not, not to try and minimize this, but that's part of what should relieve you 
there's so much going on that if you can help one part of that, you can help the student start to recover. Um, and you're, you're not particularly in school mental health, you're not trying to do long-term extensive treatment or therapy. So if you can help a student deal with the crisis that they have that day, if you can help them deal with one part of what's upsetting them, you can start to help them feel better. And during a pandemic, I, nobody's going to feel all great. So as long as you're making progress forward and dealing with any crisis that's there, obviously if there's a mental health crisis, someone's suicidal, you can't just be satisfied just making a small step forward. But for most people, if, you're, if there's something you know how to help with and you help with it, you're doing something very meaningful, even though the person may still have other types of distress. Thank you. Yeah. I also appreciated David earlier, and we're going to get to questions in a second. I appreciated it earlier when you named that um, it's not necessary nor actually trauma informed to require students and our colleagues to disclose all the details of their grief or of their loss. And it made me require. It made me remember uh, a, a professional development that I was facilitating many years ago, in which one of the participants said, "You know, wow, if I had a student told me that they were homeless, that they were not, they didn't have a home." And that made me really change the way that I treated that student. And I thought, well, if I had known that the student was homeless, then I would have treated them differently. And I really had this, we sat in conversation and wondering about why did that, why was that detail necessary to treat all students with the assumption that we're all going through something and that we all have um, potential barriers and also enormous strengths navigating our learning context. So I wanna actually lift up what Gail put in the question box, particularly around um, how to support staff and students if they have experienced loss, if they have experienced death, and if they're navigating bereavement um, as we move in, especially now in this moment when some of us are seeing second waves and surges. Um, and they, Gail, you, know, you just said loss generally, but that might be loss due to COVID or loss in, in the time of COVID. Sure. Well, first off, we have to recognize there are many different types of losses that people are experiencing at this point. There's loss from death. We call that bereavement. And so people may be grieving the deaths of someone they care about. They may also be grieving the loss of a sense of safety or predictability or the loss of graduation. So there are many different layers of loss uh, that's occurring at the same time. I think part of what we need to recognize is that um, that bereavement, so let's just talk about that type of loss. Bereavement is very common in the lives of kids. It's about nine out of uh, 10 children report that they've experienced the death of a close family member or friend at some point uh, before they turn 18. Um, and one out of 20 children in the US experience the death of a parent uh, by 16. So this is what we know happens even outside of a pandemic. So please recognize that the pandemic adds to that but it really also accentuates the chronic concerns about death. Yes. Um, so that you don't have to have a family member that died um, from this particular virus. You probably know someone else who's died for another reason or you're worried may die for another reason. So we, we also have to be a little cautious because individuals who had a grandparent die, say, of old age or of a medical problem that they had prior to the pandemic, may actually feel that it's not appropriate for them to emphasize that loss because it's not, you know, a traumatic loss in some way. So we have to recognize however you lose someone, even if you knew about it, anticipated it, or didn't know about it, it is a loss and a loss of someone important has an effect. So I think the most important thing is we recognize it. We verbalize with the child that we understand you've experienced a loss. I want and tell them you want to be of support and assistance and listen to them and help them with learning and giving them the academic supports so that you don't turn school into another stressor uh, when they've already experienced a, a very important stressor in their lives. So I, and I would refer you back to the webinar that I did on that topic for the same group and I'll go over a lot more information. The Coalition website has more as well. There is a question, thank you, there was a question about how to support school counselors in this moment and I'm curious if there are, if there are direct, um, in your experience navigating crisis, navigating traumatic loss and traumatic grief, uh, how both in the response moment and in the recovery moment do we support those who have been supporting? 
Well, first off is we have to recognize the you know, heavy impact it has on us uh, personally. You know, I, I, I did a lot of work with New York City post 9-11. I actually went in and did it was over 50 full day workshops while I still had my regular full time job. And I was living in Connecticut at the time. So, you know, it was just a, a lot of work. It was very intense. Um, we trained teams in every school in the system and every district and ran one at the city level. So it was pretty overwhelming. And what I did was I found I could never catch up with the work, could never catch up with everything I had. I went to TKS and I bought half price tickets and I went to musical comedy because for at least a couple hours, I had to turn my cell phone off. I was distracted. I needed to, I needed to take care of myself. And so I unfortunately can't go to the theater now, uh, but find what your equivalent is. What can you do to enrich and restore yourself? I also think that people who are dealing with um, large crisis events and a counseling capacity, particularly in schools, are often being asked to go outside of their usual experience. I think someone already put in the, the box that they've never had anything like this before. That's um, unless you were practicing in 1918, you probably didn't. If you are, kudos for you because you've been working a really long time. Um, so chances are this is the first experience for everyone and it is somewhat overwhelming. So I think making sure we have adequate clinical supervision, which often doesn't occur in school settings. Yep. So um, if there's someone that you can talk with on a periodic basis, just so you can run past them, what you're doing, how you're doing it, making sure that you're balancing it appropriately, and also you have someone else who's looking out for you, is useful. That may be difficult. We, we arrange that with the schools. We respond to the crisis events because we get someone, if need be, in a community setting that didn't experience the crisis. We can't do that right now because it's a pandemic and it's the whole world. So what you can do is some peer support. So maybe you just pair up with another counselor or colleague and say, I want to just run by you what I'm doing. Am, am I handling, you know, like, what do you think about yep. this? Um, so make sure that you're taking care of your professional needs as well as your personal needs. Yep. So healthy debriefing, reflective supervision, and understanding that we are not, we cannot, and we don't need to do this work alone, that this work happens in team and happens both vertically and horizontally together. Thank you, David. Thank you, Dr. Schoenfeld. We are moving. Um, I know that there are more questions. We are moving into close. Um, so I want to just I want to say again, thank you. This is the third part of our series, and we are still partnering with David moving forward into our next year of our center. So when this webinar closes, you'll get a very brief survey from SAMHSA, and that, that goes directly to us, and that is an opportunity for you to say, this is what I'd like to learn more about, this is a way that I'd like to engage in learning, so that we can provide those uh, no-cost learning opportunities to you. Um, I want to just remind you, if you have not seen this yet, that David and I co-authored the uh, School Mental Health Crisis Leadership Lessons, Voices of Experience from Leaders in the Pacific Southwest Region. Um, they, this is an incredible, incredible resource um, with um, learning from each other for crisis readiness, response, recovery, and renewal. Um, so please do check out our Crisis Leadership Lessons, and we will be providing a more intensive learning on this guide and the content in it in this coming year. Um, I also want to, again, just name that you can get all the recordings. David referenced a couple. I know that there was also the school crisis um, webinar that was referenced earlier. So everything is recorded, and you can just let us know if you need help finding it. Um, and you will get a certification of completion. So Joanne is going to support your affirmation and acknowledgement of your learning during this training. And, uh, and then we also have CEU hours available. So I know that those are really important for many of you out there in the world. So please do let us know if you want to purchase some CEUs. Um, and again, we are going to be closing. You'll get a survey. Um, we will be lining up many, many more learning opportunities in the future. We do hope that you please, please, please join us this Friday at 10 a.m. Pacific Standard Time for supporting schools and students in the context of racial violence. Um, and this is a session specifically for school counselors, school psychologists, and teacher educators. So we're thinking about, thank you, Joanne, we're thinking about the school mental health workforce. Um, I want to again 
please encourage you to check out the resources that the National Center for School Crisis and Bereavement has been working incredibly hard to land at your fingertips. And there have been a lot of resources that were floating between the comments and questions box. So I promise you that at some point in the next week, I will compile them and send them out in a follow-up email so that you have those resources at your fingertips. We look forward to having you at another one of our learning opportunities. And again, I want to extend deepest gratitude to our dear colleague, Dr. David Schoenfeld. We wish you and your family health. We wish you and your family uh, as much resourcing and as much support as you need during this time. And to all of you, thank you so much for joining us. It was 90 minutes, um, such rich learning and such rich sharing. And we wish you also an afternoon, evening, morning, wherever you are, of health and of knowing that you are not alone in this and of well wishes in this coming week. So again, thank you, and we will see you soon.